I also want to pray. Um, I, I want to pray for our county. I want to pray for our state. Um, if you were here Wednesday night, it was amazing. If you haven't been to First Wednesday, you might not be saved, seriously. Like, it, it is, I mean, you think there's a lot of energy on Sunday morning. It's nothing like Wednesday night. We had an amazing, amazing time. It, come on, somebody help me out that was here Wednesday night. Was it powerful or what? It was so good. God showed up in a powerful way. I, I'm, really, I'm really asking you to, to come to the next one. I mean, God will rock you. It's just powerful. So we had a great time together in the presence of God. There was almost 1,000 people that came out on a midweek. You could, somebody said you could tell how popular the pastor is by how, how many people come on Sunday morning. You can tell how popular Jesus is by how many will come to a Wednesday night. And that was great. We had almost 1,000 people on Wednesday night, and the food was incredible. And just think about this, the contrast of what took place in this room Wednesday night, two hours later, a shooting at Borderline. Um, 12 people lost their life. 20, 25 people lost their life in the fires. 23 people up north, two people in Malibu. Do you know we have people in our church that have been to Borderline, that goes to Borderline? I grew up in that area. They say that Thousand Oaks is the safest city in the United States. Now it's in our back door. And I just want to tell you, I'm not trying to bring fear. I'm, listen to me, I'm not an alarmist. I don't think that there's a devil behind every rock and every bush. But I do believe, I honestly believe this, that God's like, okay, you want, you want to take me off of the Ten Commandments? You want to no longer allow me to have prayer in schools. You just keep pushing me out of the country. And, uh, and I think he's just like, okay, have it your way. And, and we just see havoc all around us. I want to say two things. If you are here today and you've never begun a relationship with Christ, how many know Wednesday night when they went to the borderline, most of them had no idea that that was going to take place. And I'm telling you, this is a sign of the end times. It's just going to keep getting worse. God's trying to get your attention. And if you're if you're here and you've never invited Christ into your life, today is the day to do it. You don't, we're not, you could get in the car today on your way home and get an accident. I'm not trying to heap fear on you. I'm just saying this is real. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. For some that are kind of like in the world and in the church and in the world and in the church, you, it's time to get serious about Jesus because he is the answer to the world. Come on. So I don't know. Honestly, I don't know if I've ever done this in 21 years to give an invitation before I preach. I feel led to do it right now. Right now. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes right now? Here it is. Eternity is on the line. Jesus brought you to this place to let you know he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way to get to heaven. There's no way to have access to the Father except through the Son, Jesus Christ. He's not interested in religion. In fact, if he was upset about anything in the New Testament, it was religious people. Religion is man's attempt to get to a holy and a perfect God. He can care less about religion. He wants a relationship with you. And right now, he's knocking on the door of your heart. Some of you know you need to open up your heart. Some of you need to return to Christ. Some of you need to rededicate your hearts and your lives right now. Today is the day. Right now, starting on my left, the far left side of the building, if that's you, you're saying, Steve, would you pray for me? I want to make sure when this service is over, Jesus is Lord and Savior of my life. I turn from my ways and I turn to God. Right now in this section right here, my right, your left, go ahead and lift up your hand. And I want to agree with you. Look at me. I agree with you in the name of Jesus. Come on, lift your hand. Today's the day to get it done. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 of you, 13. Go ahead and put your hands down. Anybody here in the middle section? Today's the day. Today's the day. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, 10 people in this section right here. You can put your hands down. Off to my left, the far right side. If you hear his voice, the Bible says, don't harden your heart. I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand. There's a bunch of people in this section right here. Probably 15 to 20 people in this section. Go ahead and look at me. I agree with you in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, God lives in you right now. Thank you, Lord God. Right now, all over the building, everybody, would you repeat after me, Father in heaven? I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And I turn from my ways, because your ways are better. And today... November 11th, 2018, I turn from my sin and I embrace Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, come into my heart. I love you and I will live for you every day of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody say it. Amen. 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 We can go home right now. Seriously. Bible says in the book of Luke, if one person on the earth 
gives their life to Christ, there's a party going on in heaven. So in, in the last two services alone, we probably had 60 or 70 people. Some of those are rededication, some of those are first time. Can we join the party in heaven right now? Let's put our hands together. Uh, Andy and I were talking in my office. We said, we can't ever get used to that, people coming to life in Christ. We can't get used to what we, what we forget and refuse to celebrate. We're going to miss it. So every single life is precious. And so congratulations to everybody that lifted your hand. We have a water baptism coming up in a couple weeks. The next step is to get water baptized. And when you get water baptized, you go in the water, underneath the water, you're saying, I'm dying to my old life. And when you come up, you're a new person in Jesus Christ. So that's great. One more time, let's put our hands together and thank all these incredible people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, are you ready to study the Bible? Yes. I'm excited my daughter is home from college. Hi, Brenna. She's so awesome. Love her. My son, he's not bad. He just eats all the food in our house. Drives me crazy. All right, Daniel chapter 10, we're wrapping up our series. If this is your first time with us, we've been in a five, uh, this is week number five in our series called Stand, and this is the final installment. This is the last message. The titled message is Stand Tall. Turn to your neighbor and say, Stand Tall. Come on, Stand Tall. Andrew, you didn't say it to your neighbor. Stand Tall. Yeah, I'm watching you. Stand Tall. Come on, let's all say it together out loud. Ready? Stand I want to stand tall for God. And last week I told you in Daniel chapter 6, he's about 85 years old. Here in Daniel uh, chapter 10, most theologians say he's in his 90s now. And here's the cool thing about Daniel is that chapter after chapter after chapter, decade after decade after decade, he's still standing for God. He's refusing to compromise. He's standing strong for Jesus in his convictions, in his integrity. How many want that to be true of your life? I, I don't want him to say a whole lot when I have a funeral one day, but I want him to look back on my life and say, hey man, when Steve Abraham got saved in 1985, for the most of his life, he was standing tall for Jesus Christ. I don't want to be wishy-washy. I don't want to be watered down. I don't want one foot in the world and one foot in the church. I want to be sold out, totally committed. Anybody else here? Excellent. The 27 people that lift your hand, I join with you in Jesus' name. And uh, I just love that about Daniel. Can't wait to get to heaven and meet this guy. I just want to go like, dude, you're awesome, man. You, you stood in the lion's den. You weren't freaking out. You, 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 you were just constantly standing for Christ. And what was that like? And I can't wait to give him a big hug and say, you were my mentor. And uh, so we pick up the story, final installment, Daniel chapter 10, verse 4 through 9. And then I'm going to give you a couple of points. I'm really excited about preaching this message right now. Are you as excited to hear it? All right, Daniel chapter 10, verse 4, reading out of the NIV translation. The Bible says, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing, title of the message series, Stand, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from, help me with this word. Huh? Euphos? Okay, we'll go with Euphos. Around his waist, so Daniel's seeing a vision of God. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but rather... Uh, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid into the wilderness and the, uh, themselves. So I was telling the last service, I, I've said this before, wouldn't it be amazing if like Jesus just came through those two back doors right now? Amen. Just like, you see, you see it? And guess what service he chose to came at? The third Because he likes you better too. And, uh, and, and he came in here, I, I say this all the time. How I many of us, he walked in, we, we would just be like, hey, what's up? What's up, dog? No, you, would, you and I would be, we would be on our face, prostrate before him because he is holy, holy, holy. So you wouldn't be like, well, no, no. No, you'd be like on your face like Daniel is, uh, unable to stand before him because he's such a holy God. So I was uh, left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength. Someone say no strength. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. I want everybody to look at me. How many have ever had an encounter with God? Like not, I'm not talking about like, oh, that was a great service. I'm talking about like a real encounter. I don't think there's a lot of these. I think there's maybe four or five in your lifetime. 
and, and four or five times where you just know that, I mean, God had his hand upon you. Uh, maybe as you came forward at a service, you, whatever it was, you were at a conference or a convention or a retreat or something, and, and man, the power of God showed up, and, and the weight of God was on top. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you are looking at me weird, like, this is, this is a God thing. You can't talk me out of it. You can't say that didn't happen to you, and it's happened in my life four or five times. The first time it happened in 1985, when as a little boy raised in the Catholic Church, I came to a church like this, but it wasn't this big. It was a Pentecostal church. It was about probably 70, 80 people on a Wednesday night service. And, and I just remember being part of a Catholic church because it's real like kneel and stand and sit and liturgy and stained glass. And I came to this church on a Wednesday night. I just remember five guys with an acoustic guitar. I just remember standing there going, wow, this is so contemporary. And they didn't have all this that we have. And I, I thought, and, and it was contemporary for the time. And then the pastor got up and gave an invitation. And I could tell you, I was sitting in that section, like the last row. And because that's what most new people do. They sit in the last row like I did. I was just kind of checking it out. And I was like, this is different. This is different. And I was used to like liturgy and all this. And people are lifting their hands. And wow. It's, but he gave the invitation to receive Christ like I just did. And I, I came forward, like literally like falling forward. And I was, I was right here at, in front of the church. Not for two minutes, not for five minutes, but for probably 15 minutes. And I can feel, I can feel the Holy Spirit on me. I can feel the weight of God. I was, I was prostrate and I was bawling. God, I mean, God just had me down. He had my attention because I went to that service thinking I was too sexy for my shirt. <laughs> I was playing college basketball and I got a girlfriend. I'm doing all this. I'm going to get a scholarship. And God's like, no, I'm getting your attention. And it was like, I, I couldn't move. I couldn't move. I, he was rocking me and I could feel the presence of God for 15 minutes. And, and, and I finally stood up after 15 minutes and it was like, I got to change my life. I mean, I had like a real encounter with God. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Look around. These are people that had real life encounters with God. And and if I had a cell phone, we didn't have them back then because this was a long time ago, I would have called my girlfriend and said, we're done. But I had to drive from Ventura to Westlake to call her and I said, hey, we're breaking up. She says, why? And I said, I'm born again. She said, what, why? Uh, what, what's that? I said, I don't know. I'll, I'll find out. I'll let you know it. But God got a hold of my life and that was it. Never, uh, that was it. Relationship was over. Next day I was working at round table. When I got off of a shift at round table, when I wasn't a Christian, we would always sit down and uh, we would have a pitcher or two before we would go home for the night. And the next day I showed up and I said, hey, I'm not drinking anymore. I'm, I didn't say it like this, but I basically, hey, I'm cutting all of you off. I'm not hanging out with you anymore and no girlfriend. And I tried to stop cussing. It took me a couple months to stop doing that. But God got a hold. I'm telling you, man, I was so changed. And I want to say this. If you've had an encounter with God, you will be changed. I mean, you, you think differently. You act differently. You, you start forgiving people. You stop cussing. Let me just interject this. I am, oh, I'm so blown away. People in our church that F-bomb and blankety blank. I'm like, how could you? Like. And I've heard people say, well, it's just part of the culture. We're not part of the culture anymore. We're part of the kingdom. We're part of the kingdom. And when God gets a hold of you, he gets a hold of your mouth and your heart and your attitude. And we're not, we're not clubbing anymore. No, man, I'm going after God. And so I just want people to say, hey, hey, Steve Abraham, he wasn't perfect, but he took a stand for God like Daniel. Is that what you want for your life? So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you three principles. I'm already preaching right now. We're not doing that. So I want to just give you three things. I better settle down. But I'm excited because so many people just came to life in Christ. I'm not always this out of control. Come back next week. I'll tone it down. Thank you. So I want us to stand tall in three things. Ready? Right out of Daniel chapter 10. Here we go. I want to stand tall. You need to stand tall in your God-given identity. God-given. Notice it's a God-given identity. I need to stand tall in my God-given identity. Where'd you see that at? Where'd you see that? Uh, verse 10, after the vision, verse 10 says, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. How many know if God really did touch you? Like physically, that's exactly what would happen. We'd be trembling on our hands and knees. He said, Daniel, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. There's my identity. Some of you came to church and God wanted me to tell you, tell my people they're highly esteemed. You have a new living, anybody have a new living translation? It says this, Daniel, you are precious. What, what translation says, Daniel, you're greatly loved. That is our biblical identity. That's who we are. 
We're not what our past is. We're not what our parents spoke over our life. According to the Bible, our biblical identity, precious, loved, and highly esteemed by God. And I'll tell you, how you see yourself makes all the difference in the world. So when you look in the proverbial mirror, whether it's an actual mirror or a proverbial one, what do you see? There's typically two extremes. One is like I see myself too negatively. You want to know why teenagers cut themselves? Because they see themselves negatively. They see themselves as losers. They see themselves as ugly. They see, see themselves as never measuring up. And when you see yourself that way, you want to injure yourself. Why do you think a lot of teenage girls dress very provocatively or adult females dress provocatively because they're insecure and so they need attention? And, and why? Because they don't see themselves as secure. Because if I know who I am in Christ, I don't have to show anything. I just got to show the love of God. And so I'm not trying to get attention from men. That's not who I am. I'm a, I'm a daughter of the Most High God. And the Bible says I'm supposed to dress modestly. And so that's one extreme is I see myself too negatively. How many have ever actually looked in a mirror, though? And I'm like, because I'm like, I wish I was like four inches taller. I'm serious. 5'10". There's no 5'10 point guards in Division I. I really believe if I was 6'2 or 3, I could have played D1 ball. 5'10", come on, God. <laughs> and then sometimes I'll look at like the podcast or something. I'll, I'll pop my head up right there and I'm like, what happened to my hair? Why is it all great? Like, because I know there, there's people in their 80s, they got twice as much hair as me. And I'm like, it's not fair, man. And I, you ever do that? I wish I was skinnier. I wish I had a smaller nose. I wish I had bigger ears or no ears. I, I, you know what I'm talking about? I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. And we see ourselves, the way we see ourselves, instead of seeing ourselves how God sees us. That's one extreme. The other extreme is I see myself too positively. So you should be incredibly blessed that you're sitting next to me because I'm amazing. Have you ever met somebody that all they do is ever talk about themselves? You haven't seen them in like seven years. How you doing? Oh, but before you, t- let, me, let me tell you about my life. We just got married and we have kids. I don't know if you haven't seen our kids. And one of them's the, the star quarterback and our daughter just got accepted to Princeton. Our other son got accepted to Harvard. We're just amazing. We got a brand new house and a brand new car. And 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. How about you? Oh, I got to go. Sorry. Right. I'm just like, you know, people like that, they're the center of attention. It's all about them. Why, why do they do that? Why do they brag and boast on them and their kids? Because they're insecure. They could care less about you because they're insecure. That's another extreme. So I don't look at myself too negatively or too highly. Don't think of your too, yourself too highly as some are in the habit of doing. No, no. My identity is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Not what people say, not what I say, what God says about me. What God says about me. So all the young bucks in the room. Where's my young bucks? Like 25 and under. You're not a young buck. You, I don't even know if it's on Netflix, but all the old people like me could tell you there's a great mini series. It's the, I believe it's the best ever. Roots. How many ever saw that? Roots mini series? So powerful. I was probably 11 or 12 when it came out. It was powerful. They took these slaves from West Africa. I, listen, I've, I've been there. I, I've been in, been in Africa where the slaves got on the ship and took off, and I, I wept there. It's just it's so powerful. But I remember watching this miniseries, and they take these slaves from West Africa. They bring them here, and they, the slave traders buy them. And the story is about Kunta Kinte from West Africa in 1750. And the slave master buys him, and the whole first part of the miniseries is he's trying to get him to change his name to Toby. And he says, no, my name's not Toby. I'm Kunta Kinte from the tribe of Mendeka. My father is a Mora. He says, no, you're Toby. No, I'm Kunta Kinte, back and forth. No, your name is Toby. No, I'm Kunta Kinte from West Africa. No, 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 you're Toby. And the miniseries goes on and on. And toward the very end, they prop him up and they, the, the slave master starts to beat him. By the way, I, I know this about me. If I was there, I'm going down. I'm fighting somebody. Kill me or not, I'm, I'm jumping in and I'm gonna help Kunta Kinte. That's just me, that's my personality. I'm not gonna stand back and say, well, have fun. No, how many, how many are jumping in? Come on, man. And so anyhow, they start beating him and, and to the place of unconsciousness and finally, two, two sad things in the story. They beat him so bad and over a period of time, here's the two things that happened. He eventually allowed other people to call him Toby. That was bad and the second thing is even worse. He started calling himself Toby. Listen, that's a great picture of the enemy. 
persistent over time. He breaks us down week after week after month after month after year and says, you're a loser, you're a failure, your, your mistakes, your, your past. You're, you're, you're. In fact, we hear voices from our parents, right? You're always going to be like that. You're never going to graduate college. You're never going to get married. You're always going to be like your father. You're just like your mother. You, she loses her temper. You lose. We hear these voices, voices from other people and our own voice. And the enemy beats us down. And I'm here to tell you today, God, our identity is found in the person of Jesus Christ, not in people. It's not in my past or my performance. It's in his performance. And I got to stand in that, my God-given identity. Hey, God loves you. You are highly esteemed. You are precious to him. You don't believe me? Romans 8, verses 38 and 39 coming on the screen in the New Living says this, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing can separate me from God's love. Neither death nor life or angels or demons, neither our fears for today or worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Key word, nothing. Nothing I've done in the past, nothing that will happen in the future, nothing above me, nothing beneath me, no one, nothing can separate me from the love of God. How many, do we have any married people in the house? Mary. What's up? Mary, Mary. Remember when you started dating him or her? It was awesome. Because how many know, let's just be honest in church. I like honesty. How many know like the first couple weeks, first couple dates, you put your swag on? And you do everything right. You actually pull up to the driveway, get out of your car. Hi, Mr. So-and-so, pleasure to meet you. God bless you. You got flowers at the door, and you're so sweet to each other. And then the time goes by, right? Listen carefully. Here's the fear. Here's the fear, ready? The fear is when they get to really know me. Because, I mean, we all have our secrets. We all have our weaknesses. Don't look at me like that, man. You know what I'm talking about? Right? And we all have those weaknesses and secrets, and they're like, and we, so we're like, man, I hope she really loves me when she really finds out what I'm like. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Check it out. And, that, and that's our fear with God sometimes. Man, if God, he, he, he knows everything about you. Yeah. Way more intimately than, than your fiance or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your spouse ever has. And he knows the deepest secrets of our hearts. He knows our weaknesses. He knows the, the, the warped things we think about the cruel things that we say to one another, and despite all of it, he says, you know what, I still love you. There's nothing that can separate you. So we gotta, listen, we gotta stand in our God-given identity. You're like, well, what is it? What is it? Third service people said, how about this? We're a royal priesthood. I'm the apple of his eye. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm created in the image of God, Genesis 127. I'm a son or daughter of the Most High King. I'm a friend of God. I'm, an, I'm his workmanship or poem or his masterpiece. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm accepted right now in the beloved. He chooses me in the middle of my mess. I'm already accepted in the beloved. I'm adopted. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I am redeemed. I am forgiven. I am free indeed. I am a lender, not a borrower. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm a new creation and I'm a citizen of not this country, of another place. Come on, give God some praise right now. That's who I am. That's who you are. Come on, turn to the person next to you. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. And I got to stand in that. Praise God that I had parents. But my parents weren't perfect. They said some mean things about me. One of my own friends, I told you, one of my own friends in college said, Steve Abraham will never be a good pastor because his parents weren't pastors. And I can listen to that my whole life. And there's times that I have. Maybe I'm not going to be a good pastor. Maybe I'm not going to. Maybe he's right. Maybe I'm putting, a, he's the, listen, the enemy is the father of lies. He's a deceiver. I'm standing in who God says that I am. Amen. Number two, number two, write this down. So good, so good, so good. Number two, I'm going to stand in God's peace. I'm going to stand in God's peace. Check out verse 12. He says, then he continued, do not be afraid. God brought you to church today. He wants you to know, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Down to verse 18. Again, the one who liked, looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid. You are highly esteemed. He said, here it is. He said, what did he say? Peace. Peace. Remember that U2 song? And I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You know the culture that they're trying to find peace in all the wrong places? If I could just get, if I could just get a boyfriend, girlfriend. Then I'm going to have peace. If I could just get the right job, if I could just go to the right college, I'm going to have peace. You know, some people think that geography is the answer to peace. 
If I get us, I, I, we're never going to be able to afford a house here in Ventura County. I'm going to move to Victorville. I can buy a house. Yeah, you can. You can move to Victorville. But if you think geography is going to bring you peace, it's not going to bring you peace. Peace is found in the person of Jesus Christ. People say, well, if I could just get rid of this husband of mine, this wife of mine, these kids would just move out. If I could just overcome this hurdle, if I can get through this trial, they think if I can get rid of stuff, I'm going to have peace. No. Check this out. Peace is not found in the absence of something. It's found in the presence of someone. Go ahead and tweet that. Peace is not found in the absence. I got to get rid of this. I got to get over this. I got to get out of that trial. I got to get a new job. I got to get, no, no, it's not found in any of that stuff. It's found in the presence of someone. How I many know oh, you can be in a storm like the disciples on the boat and Jesus said, hey, I know you're going through it right now, but peace, be still. You could be going through all hell and still have the peace of God. You could go through a divorce and still have the peace of God because they say in the middle of the storm, the safest place is in the eye of the storm. So it's not in the absence of some thing, it's in the presence of some one. But how many, honestly, how many people in our culture, they think, well, parting is the answer. I go out, get drunk at the bar, and you wake up hungover with the same problems. Well, it's, it's pills, it's astrology, it's horoscopes, it's all these different things. And here's what Jesus said, and look at this verse coming on the screen, John chapter... Uh, 1427 in New Living, it says, I am leaving you with a gift. So he's going to go to heaven. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift. Check it out. What's the gift? Peace of mind and heart. Peace of mind and heart. Man, that's a beautiful gift. It's a peace that the book of Philippians says, it doesn't, uh, the human mind can't comprehend the peace of God. Because you're, you're going through something big. You're going through a huge trial and people are looking at you like, how come you're not freaking out right now? But yeah, I'm, I'm a little nervous, a little anxious, but I don't know. I just, God's just giving me this peace. I don't know how I'm going to do it financially, and I got bills to p- pay in the next couple of weeks. I, I'm just trusting God's going to come through. Yeah. Verse 12 says, do not be afraid. No, God's got this thing. I'm standing in the, the peace. It's a gift from him, peace of mind and peace of heart. And then John 16, I've told you all this, that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I have told you all this, that you may have peace. Where is it found? In me, in me. And then third thing is this. Number three, I got to stand in God's strength. Write that down. I need to stand in God's strength. Let's all say it out loud together after you write it so I can take a cup of my hot tea that's helping my voice. At the count of three, we're going to say, I stand in God's strength. One, two, three, go. Amen. Strength, the strength of God, the strength of God, the strength of God. So I, I wrote this down. See if you can identify. Ready? I wrote this down in my notes. I I know I'm in my own strength when. I know I'm in my own strength when. A couple things. Little things put me over the edge. It's like little things. My my team lost yesterday. Just lost my month. It's it's a football game. Like, honestly, in, in light of eternity, it's a football game. It's just a sport. It's not, I don't know, but it's a... Raiders, they're going to be good this year. It's just a football game, football team. Just relax. Not big of a, you know, just like little things, like somebody cuts you off, and it's, it's honestly, in life, it's just not that big of a, God, nobody, I just like, relax. By the way, when, when somebody cuts you off and you go crazy, I mean, you know, it doesn't affect them at all. They don't even probably know it. They're just off, like, hallelujah, right? You're just, <laughs> but it's like little things put us over the edge. I know I need the strength of God when little, like, Losing my keys. Actually, that's a big thing. It drives me crazy. Uh, next, I wrote this down. I, I know I need God's strength when I can't sleep and I have a really hard time waking up. Like, so I, went, I woke up this morning at like 4.20 to use the restroom and I could not go back to sleep. That's why I'm feisty right now. Like it. <laughs> How many just said like something, you have a hard time falling asleep? All the young people, you don't know what we're talking about. I'm telling you, you wait, man. You wait, you little suckers. You wait. <laughs> Not only is it hard going to bed, you're up like four or five times using the restroom. Not fun. And uh, I know I need the strength of God when I, I just, I'm having a hard time falling asleep. Maybe because I'm anxious about tomorrow. Maybe because I'm afraid about something that's coming down the pike. And the Bible says, hey, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to take care of itself. God, God will take care of you. Turn to somebody and say, God's going to take care of you. Number three, I wrote this. Uh, I know I need God's strength when everything and everyone irritates me. Stay away from Pastor Steve. 
Uh, how about this? I know I need God's strength when I don't feel like reading my Bible, praying, or going to church. The pastor just said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So not every day I wake up, I'm like, hallelujah. I get to read the Bible. I don't always feel like reading. I don't always feel like praying. There's some Sundays, not very often. There are some. Today's not one of them. There are some. All the God's people said, keyword, I don't feel like coming. <sighs> yeah, because I'm human just like you are. Some of you didn't feel like coming today. Be honest, man. What are you looking at me with that attitude? <laughs> but you came anyhow. Some, like I know sometimes you got to live it. Like I, I know I'm supposed to be here, so I come and God changes my heart. Sometimes I don't feel like doing it. Sometimes I don't feel like being nice. Sometimes I don't feel like forgiving. Anybody else out there? And then finally, I know I need God's strength when I have little joy and I magnify the negative things. Problem, problem, the problem, the, the problem. God's like, dude, you got a, like a really nice house. All three of your kids love Jesus. You have an amazing wife. You have a great church. You have running water. You have electricity. Stop looking at all the stuff you don't have. Start, and we're going to talk about this next week, a spirit of gratefulness. Start looking at all the great things that I'm doing. We could, we could have been raised in Iraq. Middle East and a Muslim, but praise God, we live in, I think, the best county on the planet, right? So let's thank God for that. But I know I need the strength of God when I start complaining too much. Check out what, he, uh, what Daniel says in verse 17. How can I, your servant, talk with my Lord? My strength is gone. You ever felt like that? I just can't hang in there any longer in my marriage. The kids are driving me crazy. My job, my bo- I, I lost my strength. I can't even breathe. Verse 18, again, the one who looked like a man touched me and what? Isn't that beautiful? One touch from God can change it all. So you came today, you're just like, I'm just, got no energy, I got no strength. God's like, let me just touch you this morning and you could walk out a totally different person. How many have ever lifted weights before? Like really lifted weights, like I'm talking a gym. Come on. Yeah, yeah, I thought thought you put your hand up. so I'm officially allergic to weights. <laughs> but I used to lift weights when I played basketball at Moore Park College. Remember the whole bench press thing? So I'd get on the bench press. I'd have like 400 on the bench. <laughs> Why are you laughing? All right, 40 pounds. I had 40 pounds. On. And, you know, you do these reps. So, like, first, first rep, 20. <laughs> Pretty easy, right? And then, okay, then Spotter jumps in. He does 20. Then next, 15. Then the third one, like 10, right? You get, and you, so some of you have never lifted. I'll just tell you, this is what happens. So I'm sitting there on the bench with my 40 pounds. And, and like the third, the third set, your arms start getting like gumby, right? Jello. And you got like four, you just like, and your spotter's like, five more. You're like, you're thinking, I, I, got, I can't do five. He's like, come on, five. And you're just like, oh. And, and you kind of got one in your hand. <laughs> And then he's like, four more. And you're like, dude, there's no way on, I could do four more. And then what does he do? He puts his hand on the bars like this. And then he's like, come on, three, three, two. And, and then I'm done. He's like, good job, Abraham. Way to go. And I'm like, he doesn't even know I didn't do anything. <laughs> the last three I did jack. That would not, right? And he goes, and he knew. I mean, you had your hands on the bar, but I'm the one that lifted it. And I think that's a good picture this morning. You know, the Christian life is all about, like, I have a part to play. It isn't like God goes to work for you. God doesn't raise your kids. Oh, you just, I just get, no, you got to do some things. The little boy had to give some loaves and fish. The lady in 2 Kings had to go knock on doors and get jars of oil. There's a part to play. But when you run out of strength, when I run out of strength, God's like, I got it. I'll get the last couple reps for you. When you feel exhausted, when you feel worn out, come to me, all those who are weary and heaven laden, I will give you I got to walk in the strength of God. Someone say the strength of God. Amen. So I need to stand in that. I got to stand in that. I wrote this in my notes. Until you fully embrace your weakness, you will never appreciate his strength. Turn to the person next to you and say, I've been dying to tell you this all service long. You are so stinking weak. <laughs> no, you are. You are. And so am I. And that's a, this is, the Bible says when you're weak, you're, it's a great sign. You can't do it. You cannot do marriage. Marriage is so hard. How do non-Christians do it? Seriously. Parenting is insane. It's so hard. Isn't it hard? I know they're so cute. <laughs> you wait. I'm telling you, wait. And you think two and three are hard, like the age two and three? No, you wait till they get to junior high and high school. I'm telling you, man. 
When they get up, you're like, oh, he knows what he was talking about. I know I don't know what I'm talking about. It's hard. You're trying to do parenting in your own strength, you're going to fail. You try to do finances in your own strength, you're going to fail. You try to do anything in your own strength. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And it's a great sign. When I discover and admit, I am weak, God, I can't do this. He's like, okay, I'll step in and I, I got it for you. So anybody in high school ever do the high jump or college high jump? You know what the high jump is? Hey, man, what's up? All right, high jump, so you're out there on the track, and you run down, I don't know how many yards, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, and then they got a pad there with the bar there, and you, they call it the Fosbury flop, you go over, world record, check this out, world record, eight feet. So I'm 5'10", it's, can you imagine jumping eight feet? That is insane. World record, guy from France just smashed the record, eight, eight feet, it's pretty high. Pole vault, same, same track. Same everything, same outfit, same bar, same pad. The only difference is the guy or a gal carries this pole, they run down the exact same thing, and they stick the pole into the ground, right? And they lean on that pole, and they put all their strength on that pole, and it catapults them. Check it out. The world record in the high jump, eight feet. World record on the pole vault, 20 feet, two inches. In other words, the pole vault, you're able to go two and a half times higher than the high jumper, doing it in his own strength. I came to church to let you know, Jesus is your pole vault. He'll take you two, three, five, ten times higher than you can do on your own. So listen, lean on his strength, lean on his power, he will take you to higher heights, higher heights, amen? I gotta stand in the strength of God. I love this verse, verse 19, let me just sum it up. It actually has all three of the points in one verse, verse 19, do not be afraid, don't be afraid, because. You're going to rest in the peace of God. Do not be afraid. You are highly esteemed. There's our identity. There's my value. Here it is. He said, peace, peace. Be strong now. Be strong. Don't be afraid. You're highly esteemed. That's your identity. I speak peace over your life. The Lord says, I speak peace over your life. Be strong. There's the whole sermon in one verse. I'm going to stand in my God-given identity. I'm going to stand in the peace of God. I'm going to stand in His strength. Listen to me. I wrote this down. I have a word I believe that the Lord gave to me for some of you. He said, tell my people the reason so many of you are under attack is because the enemy anticipates your victory. Let me say it again. The reason so many of you are under attack is because the enemy knows about your victory that the kids are gonna come back home, that you're gonna get the job, you're gonna get the promotion, the finances are coming through, you'll get a check by the end of the month, the bills are gonna get paid, the, the relationship's gonna turn around, the marriage is gonna work out, there's gonna be reconciliation. So the reason why he's freaking out is he knows that your victory is imminent. Peace of God, strength of God. Let me end with this, now we're gonna sing a song. By the way, what a great song. What a mighty God. Such a powerful song. We're gonna sing it in a little bit, not just words on a screen. It's gonna be a prophetic word over our congregation because he is a mighty God. So let me just say this. I was a youth pastor. I was coming down Victoria Avenue. I'm gonna take a left to go to my house. And I'm at the red light and right next to me, there's this car. And I look at the back seat of the car first and I see a little, like a, probably a two or three year old kid. He's got his face to the window. He's just like, I wanted to slap him, but I couldn't. And I mean, you know, you kid gives you a little attitude to say, "You'll knock you out in Jesus' name." I'll pray for you later, man. I, so he said, I looked over again. He's, I said, and I looked at the front seat, and dude, his dad, his arms. The dad, he had his arms out the window, it was like this big, big old tattoos. Tattoos weren't even popular back then. Big old tattoos, ball head. He had like this big old earring and stuff. And I looked at him and he looked at me and I'm like, hey, God bless you, man. <laughs> Look at the back seat. <laughs> hey, man, how you doing? Yeah. yeah Pray for you. So I wanted to slap the kid, but I couldn't because his dad was way bigger than me. If I would have said something to the little kid, the dad would have taken me out because his father was in the driver's seat. The enemy can't mess with you. Jesus is in the driver's seat. I've heard, pe I've heard people in our church who are like, hey, God is my co-pilot. I'm like, uh-oh, uh-oh, you're in trouble. 
He's not my co-pilot, he's my pilot, man. He's in the driver's seat. I'm just in the back seat. God, you're in control, you take me. And so I couldn't mess with that little kid because of who was in the driver's seat. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Let's thank God this morning that he's in the driver's seat. Come on, he's a mighty God. Put your hands together if you believe he's a mighty God. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. Make some noise in this place. Make some noise in this place. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Come on, put your hands together. Welcome the King of Kings. Let's sing this song together, mighty God. Come on. Praise your name, Lord God. Praise your name. Thank you, Lord. Ready to sing?